This is Future and Tech, a brand new documentary from The Bulletin with UBS on Monocle 24. In this very special episode of the programme, we're once again gathering Nobel perspectives from some of those brilliant laureates in economic sciences with whom UBS works to shine a light on the complexities and challenges of a fast-changing world. Today we'll hear from four of this select number of luminaries, Robert Solo, Christopher Sims, Michael Spence and Christopher Pizzeridis. In the spotlight today is the future and how it and our collective prospective economic growth will be shaped and reshaped by advances in technology. Now, Nobel laureate Bob Solow was one of the first to formulate the inextricable link between economic growth and technological progress. Solow takes up the story here by putting those learnings and his career-defining work in developing neoclassical growth theory into context for us. The early 1950s, everyone was interested in why uh, some economies seem to grow faster than others. I'm a great believer in simple theories. And I got to thinking about uh, what kind of simple theory would enable you to study that question? Looking at figures for the United States from about 1907 or 9 up until the 1950s, I was able to figure out three main components of, of growth that will provide increasing output in the economy. To my surprise, it turned out that by far the largest contribution came from the part that could not be explained by growing population and labor supply or growing stock of plant and equipment. Before that, I think most economists, including myself, uh, would have thought that the secret of economic growth was investment. And, uh, and that turned out not to be the case. It turned out to be a useful way of looking at, uh, at what makes an economy grow fast or grow slowly compared with others. And the, the, the primary answer is that it's a difference in their ability to make and absorb and use new technology. What we now call technological progress, now we can measure uh, some things much more accurately and in a much more refined way than we used to be able to do. You may have noticed that the talk about how the robots are coming is accompanied also by a lot of talk about how we're not experiencing very rapid productivity increase anymore in Europe or in the, in the U.S. And that's still part of the theory of growth, and, and we're learning more about it all the time. Robert Solo. So where do the learnings described by Solo there in terms of refinement of process, increasing automation, and potentially slowing levels of productivity growth leave us right now at an inflection point? And how do we most effectively identify and define both challenges and opportunities? Well, despite Solo's cautionary tone, technological progress hasn't created an urgent unemployment problem for advanced countries so far. In fact, quite the contrary, unemployment levels in many advanced nations remain at historic lows. But levels of inequality are certainly increasing. And economists have been documenting this and approaching economic growth in a different way. Growth, according to Michael Spence, should not be measured by GDP alone. It needs to be inclusive and sustainable. I got interested in um, n not only development, but the whole post-war history of, you know, false starts, two steps forward, one step back, probably historians will say in the 100 years after the end of World War II, the main event is the other 85% of the world's population actually started to have a chance. And it is an extraordinary thing to watch should it be involved in to try to understand growth patterns in which there's extreme inequality or some kind of fairly serious exclusion don't work. And they, they either don't work because there's economic waste, but more importantly, they don't work because of some sort of failure of political and social cohesion. I find all of this pertinent because I think it's sort of happening again now. 
in lots of places uh, with polarization, political parties, young people unemployed, and so on. It, there's a fairly massive failure of inclusiveness in the, in the growth patterns, not just in developing countries, but, but in the developed ones as well. Michael Spence. Bob Solo takes this idea a step further. Here he unpacks this notion of inclusive growth that Michael Spence was describing. Periods of rapid growth tend to be periods of social progress and social happiness, that it's much easier to share increasing wealth than to share wealth that's not increasing. What we want to generate is not only more growth, but better shared growth, more inclusive growth. And all the historical evidence is that it's easier for a society to be more inclusive if it's doing better, if it's expanding. Ben Friedman, a good friend of mine who teaches economics at Harvard, finds that periods of rapid growth are periods of social peace and general contentment. I think that both in Europe and increasingly now in the US, the fact that, that we are not increasing, that we're not growing very rapidly, tends to make for, uh, for social conflict. So Europe, like the US, has to find a way of uh, becoming more productive, uh, more efficient. Bob Solo, and before that, Michael Spence. One only has to look at the socio-political status quo across much of Western Europe and in the United States at the moment to see the manifestation of exactly the kind of social conflict and diminishing cohesion that Solo's describing. So how to address that? How to pursue inclusive growth? Well, first, how do we define that exactly? Inclusive growth, according to the OECD, is distributed fairly across society and creates opportunities for all. The OECD writes that growth as we know it doesn't work for all and is putting everyone's well-being at risk. We need to develop new and improved models and focus on ensuring growth actually improves lives. People would feel more involved if the benefits of economic growth were not allowed to flow into the pockets of a rich minority. Here's Michael Spence again. There's a major challenge in lots of different places and globally to change the growth pattern so that they, they're more sustainable. We need to stop measuring development using per capita GDP. That growth is really best thought of as a growth pattern, that it's a multidimensional thing and that it needs to be tracked on that basis. What role does technological progress play here? The technology may be sparking economic growth, and we at least had one outburst of that in the late 90s and early you know, 2000s. Um, and that was associated, I guess, with um, the, the, the fact that the digital technologies enabled the automation of a whole lot of things. Um, but we are living in a world in which uh, there's a whole lot of digital technology that people th think is high potential that doesn't show up in productivity growth, which has been declining on a pretty much uh, uniform basis, at least across the advanced economies. And so it's at least a question mark whether and when the digital technology is going to turn out to to start generating real growth. Christopher Sims shows that there's a large number of people whose real wages are either flat or going down, while there's an increase in wealth for the already wealthy. This increase in inequality is affecting high and middle income countries. Inequality in the United States, for example, has been increasing since the 1980s and others are facing similar problems, as Sims explains. It's certainly true that if technological progress slows down, the growth in wealth is going to slow down. Now that in itself shouldn't be that big a problem. If you go back to 1950 and look at the US, the growth, the steady state growth rate and its rate of technological progress has been drifting slowly downward. And it probably will continue to do that. At least the growth rate will continue to slow down. We have economic theories that explain how it can be that growth slows down as countries get richer and accumulate more capital. And I don't think that's inherently a problem. 
Well, I guess that prompts a question which one hopes isn't facile, namely, where, therefore, Chris Sims, does the problem lie? It is a problem that uh, technological progress and or the opening up of world markets, we're not quite sure what, what mix of causes is producing this, but we're getting uh, increased inequality of incomes. And that combined with slow growth means that there's large numbers of people in the US and also in Europe whose uh, incomes are flat or going down. And yet at the same time, some people at the top whose incomes are growing rapidly. You could say, well, if the economy is getting richer as a whole, the economist's solution is tax the people who are getting richer faster and spread the wealth a little bit. <laughs> but it doesn't happen as easy, easily as that as uh, politically extreme nationalist political movements uh, started in the wake of this kind of economic stagnation for middle class people. So it's a big problem, uh, but not a political problem. Chris Sims. So a political problem? There are things that governments for sure, but also individuals can do for better shared growth. Christopher Pizzarides explains that if adequate policies are implemented, there's no need to be afraid of the apparent uncertainties that surround future technological developments. I'm also worried about inequality, but the main reason that I'm worried about inequality is because of the lower wages that they are not going to benefit very much from this technology. So that's where government policy is most effective, you know, to provide good social services, good infrastructure, help with uh, job creation at the lower end. People are worried about inequality and um, the government's failure to deal with it because they're worried about redistribution from top incomes to low incomes. Christopher Pizzarides. So how best to address a challenge that's been elegantly characterised by our panel in this documentary as both immediate and extensive? Pizzarides, recognised as the originator of some radically new frameworks for understanding the labour market, is as well placed as anyone to answer that very question. An issue then for nation states, for governments to tackle? What governments can do with the new technology is, first of all, make it possible for the companies to adopt the new technology, keep a flexible labour market, one that is friendly to the introduction of new technologies, negotiate with uh, social partners, unions, in a way that that makes it a positive for all of them. You know, in other words, it, it, won't, it should be encouraging the ownership of these technologies. And the second important function of government is to help those who will be hurt, in this case, middle to lower incomes. And that's where government needs to step in and provide good social support, social services, provide uh, subsidized uh, health care for these people, um, help them relocate, help them re-educate themselves in the new technology. Uh, lifelong learning is important. The focus of government policy when it comes to inequality should be at the lower incomes. As Christopher Pissarides himself has previously attested, economics has done more for human happiness and preservation of life than any other science or discipline. So we should, as he's demonstrated in both his life's work and his remarks today, retain an optimistic view of the future and technology. An appropriate note, perhaps, to draw to a close this very special edition 239 of the Bulletin with UBS, setting the agenda each week here on Monocle 24. To read more from and about the laureates and to discover how Nobel perspectives shape the UBS worldview, head to ubs.com forward slash Nobel. And keep an eye and an ear on this programme in the weeks and months ahead as we enjoy more access to the brilliant insights of the Nobel laureates. More special episodes and documentaries are in store. But if that's just too long to wait, why not dip into a great mix of videos and articles at the UBS Nobel Hub. The Bulletin with UBS on Monocle 24. Thank you.